Hi all, my name is Ian O'Byrne. I'm giving a uh, recorded talk for my session uh, titled Student Privacy and Pandemics, Understanding and Reducing Privacy and Security Risks. We're going to think a little bit about the culture of privacy and, and security in our institutions, our educational institutions. For the most part, this is going to be geared for a audience that includes instructors and educators in higher education. Obviously, this is going to have a lot of connections to what we're seeing in K-12, but, but for the purposes of this conference, we'll focus primarily on uh, higher ed. Um, also, this is uh, presented with the understanding that we are coming out of uh, you know, this global pandemic and an understanding that COVID has really changed our thoughts and value systems as they re are related to uh, technology. In many ways, it's really expedited um, what we're seeing. So just uh, one of those other elements to keep in mind. Uh, my name is Ian O'Byrne. Uh, you can follow me online. I am available on Twitter, um, pretty much every social network out there. Um, my website and my newsletter are listed there. Those are the two top ways to stay in touch with me. My social accounts change over time depending on what those social accounts, uh, what the, the belief systems are at those accounts. Um, we'll start with a quote uh, from the SoftBank CEO. Um, the uh, the original portion of this quote talks about those who make the chips uh, will rule the entire world and then those who rule the data um, and this is what the future uh, people will say so it's just being thoughtful of um, what data means and how we make sense of data um, so uh, this session will focus on the policies practices and procedures that schools should in implement to establish trust promote transparency, and uh, create a culture of privacy in our institutions. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about current and future context. Once again, that is um, a moving target as we think about COVID and coming out of COVID. Um, and as technology advances, of course, uh, I'll talk about some of the terms that we need to know and understand, and then also that what can we do or questions that we should ask as we think about this culture of privacy. Um, so to set the stage, one of the, the things to keep in mind is the vast amount of data that we are creating. Um, and so, you know, from the, the dawn of time to 23 uh, to 2003, uh, humans created about five exabytes worth of data. That still is a lot. Um, but as of 2013, and this number is exponentially increasing we know that you know the next billion people online will be non non-native english speakers as more and more of the world becomes connected so as of 2013 humans are producing the same amount of information as we did in the earlier piece um every two days um and so what does that mean to us it's hard to get an understanding of how much data this is so as of 2013, the world holds twice as many bytes of data as there are liters of water in all of the oceans of the world. Um, so we are literally swimming, perhaps drowning in the amount of data that we have, but then also that we're creating. And this is exponentially uh, changing as technology advances and becomes more ubiquitous. Um, this data in and of itself uh, is not very useful. Um, but if we can extract the data and refine it um, and analyze it and make sense of it, um, then we can make decisions about what's happening in the data. Uh, the benefit of that um, is that we can use this data to be predictive. We can understand trends. Um, the challenge of this is how, how quickly can we turn over that data? So if we're gathering all of this data on, a, an, individ, on an individual or a group, um, you know, we can analyze that, but then there's a question that we need to ask about um, first of all, is it good data? Uh, second, is it something that we can quickly understand what's happening, make sense of that data, report that data to the people that need to make the decisions, and then make decisions based upon it, and then roll out those decisions? Um, so just having the data in and of itself is not a value. It's being able to to quickly, nimbly, agilely uh, take this information, make sense of it, and pump it out to uh, decision makers and then make changes. Um, that's the, the real key here. Um, 
the the challenge here is um, how do we use big data? How do we uh, you know wi- you know harness this power while also protecting staff, protecting faculty, and most importantly protecting our students? Um, so yes, there is this vast amount of data that we could collect um, that we are collecting, but how do we protect our students? Um, you know, there are powerful opportunities to leverage th- this data and analyze and interpret data um, to help predict the students that are going to apply for our programs, that are going to remain in our programs, that will, when they struggle, how can we implement some measures to help them complete? Um, so using that data thoughtfully, intelligently, making sense of that data and then rolling it out, there is the opportunity to really understand where in the learning trajectory or where in that pathway students might get lost and then alert us when they are getting lost. Um, The challenge here is that we can't assume that just because we're integrating data, that we're using the data, that um, ethics is not a problem or ethics is not a question. Um, There is the famous case of a uh, target that was monitoring um, a, a, an individual that was going in and out of the store and monitoring what the, the individual is buying at Target. And so Target started sending ads to the home of that individual. Uh, it turns out the individual was, an, was a, a young female. And so the, the, the parent, the father at the home, basically wondered why they started getting these ads from Target you know, uh, you know, and, and coupons to buy like baby diapers and stuff like that. Um, and so the, the, the father was wondering what was messed up and, and what was wrong and why they started to get um, these coupons and ads. And it turns out that the, the, the daughter was pregnant and Target knew before, um, you know, the, the family knew. Um, so we have to be thoughtful about ethical considerations. We have to think about just because we we can or could capture all this data and, and use it to predict the future, should we do that? Um, and that's a, an it's an unanswered question. Um, I think each one of us needs to address that question in our own spaces. But then also, I think that the hope of this talk here is to identify some of the concerns and then provide a space for people to go back to their communities and have these discussions. So some of the things that we need to know, first of all, what is data? Uh, Data just literally are individual facts, stats, um, items of of information, often numeric data. Um, They could be qualitative or quantitative in nature, um, and they are about one or more people, individuals, objects. Um, Sometimes data and information is used interchangeably, but it's important to know that those two things are different. Um, So data can be, as we talked about before, data can be transformed into info. Um, And that's after we're looking at it in context or after analyzing it. So we get that raw data and then it can be information that we pass on to others, but there's a lot of mechanics in between that sort of make that a possibility. We talk about big data. Um, These are data sets that are much too large or too complex to uh, be handled by traditional data processing apps. Um, So we're looking at large data sets across multiple groups, multiple people, multiple layers. um, And they also have a lot of individual components of that data. Um, And so they, um, you know, might be you know, first of all, as we said, a large data set, so a, a, a number of people, okay, a very large group, but also the data set might be complex, meaning there's a lot of different components. So if we're looking at a class of students, I might capture uh, the data from their, um, you know, GPA, I might capture race, ethnicity, uh, I might capture where they grew up, I might capture their, um, you know, SAT scores or Praxis scores or other data. So what we're doing is we're pulling in a large sample size, but then at the same time, sort of layering in and nuancing in um, the, the, the complex data set that's out there. Um, when we look at big data, 
we're looking at the five V's. So we're looking at the nature of the data, but then also the outputs, what we can do with it. So for the, the first three, we're looking at volume. So how big is big? How much uh, is involved in this? What is the sample size or what does the data set look like? Um, velocity, that's what we talked about earlier. How much time is it gonna take for our group to collect that data, make sense of it, and use those insights to make decisions and get those decisions or those insights to the decision maker uh, or makers. Um, there's also the challenge of the variety of data that we're looking at. So yes, we can pull in data from different sources and we can get a bunch of different data points um, and it can be a challenge to sort of like connect those dots. So as an example, I might have a student's GPA I might also know if they sign up for, you know, what is the, the speed of the internet they have at their home? Do they have dial-up? Do they have high-speed broadband? Do they have a fiber connection? Do they have no internet at all? So I might have that information, but what is that information really telling me about their ability to attend, succeed, and complete in college as an example. Um, when we look at the, the output, we're thinking of two things. We're looking first at veracity, um, you know, and it's garbage in is garbage out. Um, and so the quality of the output is going to depend on the quality of the input and the processes used to refine it. Um, so if we have bad data going in and the, uh, the analysis is bad and it's complex and it's not thoughtful and it doesn't make sense and it doesn't work if it's just plain bad, then the output, the info that we get on the other side is also going to be bad. Um, and so sometimes you know, there is a concern that if we see a report coming out of data, there's the assumption that good data went in and the analysis was correct and then we get good information on the outside. We can't make that assumption. We need to know all of those components so that we can look at the output, the information in context. And last but not least, visualization. Um, it's hard to make sense uh, and see what's happening in the data. And so there is a need to, um, you know, that's why data visualization is terribly important right now. There's a need to transform this information, this abstract info, these large complex data sets into physical images, um, bar graphs, uh, pie charts, um, you know, a, a representation that quickly shows human beings how to understand and extract meaning from this information. Um, so just giving you know uh, a, a one a, a numerical value or or that sort of representation is not really going to help. There's a need to visualize that information, and then you know obviously there's going to be the challenge of when we have the output and we get that response, we visualize it, do we trust the visualization that occurs? Um, the next term that we want to talk about is privacy. Um, so privacy is the ability of an individual group to seclude themselves or information about themselves um, and express themselves selectively. Um, the, the idea of uh, privacy is changing through the you know because of the the ubiquitous rise of technology and data collection across society because the internet is the com is the dominant text of our generation because social networks are now our town squares um, most of our interactions are are being surveilled and data collected on us and so what privacy means is quickly changing um and so one easy way that I think about privacy um, is I think about, um, you know, I, on my house, I'll close the blinds, um, you know, I'll close the curtains so that what's happening inside my home, people cannot see uh, from the outside. So one way to think about privacy is that idea of like closing the blinds or drapes on your house so that people cannot see in through the windows. We think about security, it's vastly different. So security is protection from or resilience against unwanted change, potential harm caused by others, um, by restraining the freedom of others to act. So, you know, stopping other people from getting in and messing with your stuff. Um, we think about security. Security could be for an individual, a group, an object, an institution, an ecosystem, a culture, a community, um, any sort of 
uh, you know, entity of value that we have concerns about it being modified or changed or taken or, or harmed by others. And when we think about security, once again, if we use the house analogy um, or a home analogy, I might think about, okay, well, we we lock our doors and we lock our windows. Um, you know, some of us might turn on an alarm, um, you know, and so locking and securing the house is that process of locking the doors, locking the windows, and basically trying to be, make sure that, you know, this is protected and it's, you know, we're stopping it from being harmed. We think about identity. Um, as our lives become increasingly digital, our digital identities are, com are composed of, comprised of, our digital footprints, the breadcrumbs that we leave behind, the data points that we leave behind. Um, and so this might be when you go to get coffee, it might be the receipt from that, it might be the social media check-in that you have from there, it might be using your points, um, you know, or your, your, your card, you know, your community card when you're getting coffee, it might be use of maps, getting to and from the coffee uh, house. Uh, so there's a lot of data that we collect um, we may collect it, we may know, we may not know, but there's data being collected and aggregated and stored by a number of people. On our campuses, it might be students checking into class, students signing into the learning management system, students uh, communicating with others through the virtual, uh, uh, through the online classroom. There's a lot of different ways we're thinking about identity as and, and data as a component of our identity. So we think about identity, we think about two different parts. One is the fact uh, of being, um, who or, or what that person is. So that's basically my, my name, my race, my sexual orientation, um, you know, basically who am I and what, what, you know, that means about me. And then we get down into other parts, the characteristics determining who or what that person is. Um, so I might start looking into my GPA, my progression and classes and stuff like that, and all that extra data that is collected about me. So if we want to think about a culture of privacy or developing a culture of privacy in our educational institutions, there's a couple things that I focus on and here is the, the, the crux of, of this, this whole discussion. I, I think that there's two areas that we want to look at um, because we don't really have that much um, control over the situation. So if I'm an, an educator, an instructor in higher ed, if I'm an educator, instructor in K-12, pretty much the same deal. Um, but I don't really have a lot of discretion for creating or enacting change. Um, I think that there's two ways that we, we can enact change. And a lot of that is about education. It's about advocacy. Um, um, it's also about empowering people that we interact with. So the first is our interactions with our students. Um, it, it involves the technologies that we use as we interact with students in our classes, in our learning management systems, um, the technologies that the institution gives us and we have students use, but then it's also the, the other tools that we might have a student use in our classroom. So one of the, the tools that I use in my classes is Flipgrid. It's a way to have students uh, you know, have video chats with one another, um, I have students sign into Flipgrid with their uh, Microsoft account that the institution gives them, um, but it's it's not something they're automatically signed up for, like an email through the institution. Okay. Um, the second area is thinking about the administrators, the decision makers above the educator, above the instructor, um, and thinking about your role within the institution to ask questions. Um, about decisions that are being made. Um, so the first one is thinking about our students. Um, in other posts on my blog, in other workshops I've, I've conducted, I talk about digital hygiene. Uh, it's the ways in which we interact in these digital spaces and the practices that we use. Um, and, and I see that as being important everywhere we go. In the context of this discussion, we're thinking about home, school, work, um, and thinking about how we use these digital tools. So one of the first things that I suggest is in your class with your students, talk about passwords. 
Talk about how they're accessing the information. These might be things that you have them set up for the purposes of the class. So if there's an e-text and they have to create a new account to access it, it's that. It's talking about passwords that they use to connect with the learning management system or with their email. Anytime they are interacting and communicating with um, a, a system, the, the tools that they use, the passwords, the techniques, the practices they use to interact. So take time in class to talk about what is their way that they negotiate that process. Think about passwords and the systems they use to keep track of it. It'll take you five minutes, 10 minutes in class to talk about it. It's worthwhile. So when you say go to this site and log in, have a little spiel about what that means and what that looks like. I also suggest using two-factor authentication. Um, so, uh, as a as a you know, to take a step back for a sec, I always suggest that all of you, uh, you know, instructors and educators, you need a, a a system to keep track of your passwords, and it shouldn't be just a list that you have written on your desk. Um, so you and our students need that, but then also adding two-factor authentication. So it might be an app on our phone that gives us a, a code that we need to type in. It might be a, um, you know, a uh, key that we plug into our computer. But have discussions with our students about the passwords and possible two-factor authentication and, and think about that. Um, be deliberate about those discussions as we interact. Um, I also think it's important to talk about protection, you know, connecting to those networks and protecting, making sure that our devices are protected and encrypted so nobody can access data if they have physical access. So it's our laptops, um, making sure that we're signing in and signing out when we walk away. When we walk away from our computers, logging out. Um, if we leave our devices out, if we leave our tablets out or our cell phones out, it's making sure that we have some way to log in and log out. You know, it might be a biometric, meaning our face or our thumb. It might be a, a key code, but just making sure that these devices are all protected and encrypted. This might not be the focus of your class. That's fine. Um, we need to build these skills in our students. We need to have these skills as well. Um, we need to, to make sure their students are prepared for the future in which they will live and work and learn and laugh and love. So it's important to make sure that they, they know uh, good hygiene in digital spaces. Um, I also pay attention to social logins. Um, so when we sign in, my earlier example of using Flipgrid, I had students use their Microsoft account. Um, they also could use their Google account or their Facebook account or their Twitter account to log in. Many of us will do that to make our lives a little bit easier. It's important to periodically review what permissions we've given these different tools and apps and then take them away or revoke them if they're not necessary. Um, and so there's a way to go into Google and Twitter and Facebook and, and Apple and any of these logins, these social logins and see what permissions and apps you've given permission to, to look at your data and you know as you log in. And then also last but not least, thinking about your connection to the network um, it's first of all using the appropriate network for the institution. At my institution, we have uh, one network, one Wi-Fi network that is used by all students and staff and faculty. Then there's a guest network. A lot of my students or a lot of my colleagues I see will use the guest network just because they don't know how to or they've had troubles logging into the established network. Um, I wouldn't do that. I'd also be thoughtful about when I go to a hotel or when I go to a restaurant, um, signing into the Wi-Fi that they provide. Um, and so in addition to using only a couple networks um, that, that seem like they are, are, are credible and, and private and secure, but it's also using a privacy-focused browser like Firefox or like Brave or other browsers, and then uh, a virtual private network or a VPN if that is something that is uh, available or you know how to do it. Um, and last but not least, I would talk about understanding and cleaning up the digital workspaces. So as we... 
uh, learn, work, and collaborate is making sense of the tools that we use and where we use them. So if I'm using Google Docs or I'm using Flipgrid or using our, our uh, Canvas or a learning management system or Blackboard or Google Classroom or Teams or wherever I'm doing the work, it's understanding what the different spaces are. Um, Sometimes students and faculty, educators, instructors are confused about where the work occurs and we quickly get lost moving from space to space to space. So as an educator, it's important to uh, be deliberate about the what, why, and how you are teaching and the different spaces and what they mean. Outline the differences between those cloud-based and computer-based workspaces. So if I'm doing uh, making a, this PowerPoint demonstration on my laptop and it stays there, that's one thing. But if I'm using a cloud service, so if I'm using like a Microsoft Office Online or Google Cloud or, or Google Slides, um, there is a difference. So how do I? access this? How do I search for it later? How do I find it later? How do I share this with others? So share this slide deck with people that are watching it. And then how do I back it up so that it doesn't disappear over time? Um, and most importantly, how do we export content and delete all content or the account if needed? So if we're going to ask our students to sign in to the online book service or the EPUB or the digital version of a text or Flipgrid or whatever tool or whatever product or service we use in our classrooms, do we take time in our class to talk to our students about how we sign in and how we save our passwords and all that? But also, most importantly, at a later date, if they decide they don't want this anymore, how do they export their content and delete that account? Um, and, and if they can't, we make sure that they know that before they're signing up. Um, and, and, you know, perhaps we reach out to the developers to ask how that is make, made available so that students can uh, be thoughtful about where they're leaving their data behind. Um, now I want to shift a little bit and look above the educator and above the instructor and think about the institution itself. And think about the decision makers, the administrators, um, the, the people that... Uh, you know, not the developers, not the companies pushing these things. That is a different discussion. Um, but the people at our institution that we might be colleagues or peers with, or they might be our supervisors. So the first thing to think about is the student data warehouse. So this is the, the people, the policies, the practices, the technologies that handle data about our students and about us moving throughout the institution. So one of the things to, to ask and one of the things to be considerate of this is uh, who's in charge? So who are the people that that make these decisions? What are the policies? Okay, these should be spelled out. This should be transparent so that we can understand what's happening. What are the practices? How often are we collecting data? What are we doing with the data? And then the technologies, what are the tools that they are using to capture that? Um, so there's a lot of trust baked into this. Um, you know, it's trusting the people. Um, are the people there? Did they, they were appointed and they're given this power and then they left the institution and they went to another institution? Are they still there? What is the, 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 the changeover in these rules and privileges and responsibilities? What are the policies involved in that? What are the practices? And then what are the technologies that they use to collect and manage all this data? Because we're trusting that those technologies are good. Um, when we bring in new technologies, when a new app comes in, so pre-COVID, none of us really cared about Zoom. Uh, Zoom was not one of the tools that we used uh, regularly. It wasn't really, in my humble opinion, really a good online video conferencing software. Um, you know, we would use Skype. Uh, we might use Google Meet or Hangouts or some YouTube Hangouts or YouTube on air. Um, we didn't really use Zoom, but now, throughout COVID and, and leaving COVID, um, you know, Zoom is looked at as part of the infrastructure of our educational institutions, and that is problematic. So as we bring in new technologies, um, is the decision behind this transparent to all users? So who decided that we we're all moving to Zoom? Okay, were, were, were our institutions paid to do this? Um, you know, is this transparent do we understand what's happening um and and the the you know the the rub here is that FERPA 
is is basically indicating that um, you know we need to the individual needs to understand all of these decisions that are being made about them and their data. Um, if we're not transparent, then this request is unreasonable. Um, and FERPA doesn't have have as much to do with us in higher ed as it does in K-12, but it, we're still, for the most part, guided by these principles. Um, we need uh, you know, our institutions to support students, support faculty, support staff. We need to provide the tools and the understanding and the transparency about the technology that's being used and about the data that's collected um, and how they can not only understand it but control um, those components. And then lastly, um, and once again, there's a lot of decisions and discussion that need to be made outside of the institution, you know, thinking about the technology itself um, and, and the pipes that connect it all. But outside uh, of the other, uh, the other two, when we think about our admins and the people that make those decisions, we want to talk about um, the individuals that we're collecting data on. So the students, the faculty, the staff, um, do they have real control over that? about the, the control, the collection, the storage, the aggregation. Can they oversee their data? Um, do they own their data? Um, can individual students, faculty, staff, can they request a copy of the data that the institution has of them? Um, can we uh, delete the data after a certain period of time? So some school districts, some institutions have a data deletion day. So they say at the end of you know, five years or at the end of one year, we're gonna have one day that we delete all of this data over here that we don't really need. Um, so if we think back earlier in this uh, discussion, I talked a little bit about velocity. <coughs> Excuse me. I talked about velocity and thinking about, <coughs> oh. I talked about velocity and making sense of the data and making decisions about that data. <coughs> Ooh. Okay, I'm back. So some institutions, K-12 school districts, institutions of higher ed, have a data deletion day. So they might have the opportunity to say, okay, we don't need this information anymore. If we think before to the five V's, we want to think about velocity. We want to think about what we do with this data. Is the data that we're collecting meaningful? Are we making decisions? You know, if we're collecting data on students that are in our school now, are we collecting that data, aggregating that data, analyzing it, making sense of it, reporting it to decision makers, and are decisions being made that are going to impact the students that are in that, you know, that institution that year, or at the very least, the next year or the year after that. If we're making decisions about students that are no longer there, um, that left years prior, depending on our, our question or our research focus, then that data is not worthwhile. Um, so why are we collecting it? Once again, why are we making decisions using bad data, bad analysis, bad information? So if we don't need this, can we get rid of it? Uh, if we have students that leave the institution, faculty, staff that leave the institution, does that data stay there? Okay, um, so I have been in and out of different educational systems throughout my life. Can I go back to my K-12 system? Can I go back to uh, you know, my master's level program or my PhD level programs and say, I'd like a copy of everything that you have on me or I'd like you to delete everything that you have on me. Do I have that power? I should. Um, so it's just being thoughtful about uh, control. Um, so to wrap things up, we, we live in a world, our students are growing up in a world where data breaches have and will happen. Um, and, and we need to create a space where when these things happen, students can make, can know that they happened and can make decisions about what to do. Um, so if we see a, a credit company, you know, a company that, uh, keeps credit information and reports that to others, if they are, uh, if there's a data breach and they are quote unquote hacked, do people know 
exactly what happened? Are we transparent in this? A lot of times we, you know, these institutions are not. Um, so we also, our students are growing up. We are living in a world where uh, our data is part of the business model. And we have questions about the, the free services that we use, the online digital services that we use, um, and then also some of the, the ways that data is collected about us that we don't know. So being thoughtful of the, the target example before where we're paying attention to where individuals are in a store or if we're using our, our, our credit card to buy coffee. Uh, for the most part, we've really lost control. I'm not gonna say that we have little to no control. We've lost control of our data. Um, and, and we don't really know how much the, the internet has been become largely unintelligible. So we really have no understanding of this component of our digital identity um, and what that means, let alone control it. When we come to our learning institutions, we can't have the expectation and our students shouldn't have the expectation that they are also part of this process. Um, we haven't fully come to terms in society about whether it's okay to learn and change our thinking over time. So can I be wrong over time? Uh, as we see students age up through K-12 and go through higher ed, is it okay for them to learn and fail over time? In our learning uh, environments, we talk about grit and we talk about reframing failure and we talk about growth mindset. All of these mean that um, it's important for us to provide students the grace and space to fail and learn and get things wrong and try again. If we're collecting data on these different time points and they're re being reported out at a later date, we're not really being, we're, we're being disingenuous to our students. So our students, our staff and our faculty as well, but our students should not enroll in our in our educational systems they should not enroll in our higher ed institutions with this assumption that they will become part of this surveillance system um, they should not sign uh, and pay uh, with the understanding that they now will also uh, we will collect and aggregate and sell their data uh, as part of the process so if we're thinking about that quote that we started this whole talk with our students, the, 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 the future of this planet, you know, the, the people that we're interacting with, they should control their future. They should rule their data. Um, they should have ownership of those breadcrumbs that they leave behind. We should create a space um, and, 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 and continue or start discussions at the very least about what this means and, and what it means for them as they work their way through our systems. So thank you once again for making it through to the end. Apologies for uh, the, the coughing fit in the middle. Um, if you want to stay in touch with me, I put my Twitter link there. I don't know how long that'll last. Um, I have my email address and my, my links for my uh, uh, blog and then also my newsletter. Um, so please stay in touch and reach out with any questions that you might have. Thanks a ton.